This is a story of a man named Nineball, who decided to do a podcast with a man named Archon. Little do they know, people would actually tune in for the podcast. Lo and behold, people showed up from near and far to listen of Nineball and Archon's experience in the game they all loved, Diablo 3. And it turns out some of the information we shared with our guests was actually true, and they might have learned something along the way. And so here we are, on episode 6 of Westmarch Workshop. We're bringing you up to speed on the news, and we're giving you some builds that hopefully you can use. Take what you can, try to ignore all the lies we sneak in between the truths, and watch as Archon and Nineball fight to get along in this small, tiny apartment. Welcome to The Odd Couple. Or wait, sorry. Westmarch Workshop. There we go. Westmarch Workshop. Yeah. All right. Well, welcome to the show, everybody. Here we are. Here we are. Episode six. Yeah. You thought we would made it this far. Yeah. You thought we were going to run out of ideas for our our improv intros. Yeah, but uh, they keep coming. I guess yeah. that's the thing about improv. You just you. You never run out of it. it. Exactly. Yeah, it just goes on forever. So so you guys are stuck with our our uh, impromptu intros until we run mm -hmm. out of improv. Yeah, we will continue to make them up about 30 seconds before we actually start streaming. Yeah, that's pseudo-improv, I guess. But enough about non-Diablo stuff. How was your uh, Diablo week, Nineball? Um, my week in gaming was actually uh, pretty good. Uh it's like I want the the big thing is of course has absolutely nothing to do with gaming. It's last night I got BlizzCon tickets, so I'm still excited about that. Whoa. I'm very sorry. I wouldn't say that has I'm... nothing to do with gaming. But... <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's true. It does have a little bit to do with gaming, but um, definitely psyched about that. Especially seeing all the horror stories about uh, people having issues with Eventbrite, people getting kicked out of the line, put back in, and then getting tickets before other people that were in the line the whole time, the whole nine yards. So I just. Mm, yeah. I just it's like I'm set. I'm good. I got my tickets. Now I just have to worry about uh, plane and hotel and such. Yeah. Well, uh, good for you. I'm still. Uh, I'm in that second batch of people. That mm -hmm, is. I've, yeah. We had like six of us trying to get tickets. Um. I don't know which two weren't going to go if only one person got in, since you can only get four tickets. Uh, mm -hmm. We hadn't. We hadn't thought that far ahead, but um, none of us got in, so we didn't have to worry about that dilemma anyway. Yeah, it was a it was a similar situation. I think that there were seven of us trying, and only two managed to get tickets. Oh wow! Yeah. yeah. So did they buy four tickets each? Um. Yeah. So, so we, got, seven we got we got. Yeah, at least seven of us. Seven of the others are good. You know, people from the guild. You know, hmm. World of Warcraft guild. Shh, don't tell anybody. Um, <laughs> what blasphemy! <laughs> blasphemy! Like Diablo and that, World of Warcraft. That name in here. Um, <laughs> But uh, getting into my actual weekend gaming, I have uh, started leveling up my monk. It's, forgive me, softcore, but I figured, you know, yes. it would give some opportunity that uh, Archon and I could play together because it'd be easier for me to level up a softcore character than it would be for him to have to constantly re-level up hardcore characters. Because... Yes, because Nineball assumes correctly that I would die over and over again just trying to get to level 70. There is only one thing that a hardcore character is going to do, and that is die. No matter how well geared you are, <laughs> how much time and how much effort you've put into your character, it will die. Uh, what is it? Uh, Xanth, the hardcore writer over at Ink Gamers, you know, he got his Witch Doctor to Paragon 100 and just kind of stopped playing it before the expansion, <laughs> and he was dead within a week. No, uh, that's so yeah. sad. Although yeah. Paragon 100 means so little nowadays, I guess. Yeah, nowadays. I mean, nowadays even I'm Paragon 100. So even this guy, <laughs> even me. So that that pretty much uh, that was uh, that was my weekend gaming. Um, other than that, here's the storm is really addictive. Even though I I suck at mobits. <laughs> Uh, no, but it's, how it's about very, you? Very. I think uh, Heroes of the Storm is very nice to new players. I've had that same experience. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't play much Heroes of the Storm this week. I did play some STD. STD. I just, yeah, I had a yeah. Um, STD for anyone who doesn't know, it stands for Squadron Tower Defense. Oh. Or Squadron okay. Transmitted Disease. One of the two. But um, the one we were playing was the Tower Defense. STDs are BOP. Yes. 
<laughs> yes, yes, the other kind of STDs are. That's that's a good point. Yeah. Um, yes, and, and you can't uh, disenchant them either. They're they're there to stay. Yeah. Yep. Little, you got a little uh, um, public service lesson here during the show too. We like to sneak those in for our younger folks that haven't taken health class yet. Anyways, um, I played the fun kind of STD. And um, it's a lot of fun. It's a uh, use map settings map on StarCraft where waves of enemies come, you build towers, and then you do nothing. You just watch your towers, which from like a game design point is kind of fascinating that you can have a lot of fun. I guess tower defense in general, you can have so much fun just watching a game and not even participating. I mean, you build the towers beforehand, but the most fun part, you're just looking at the screen, right? You're, yeah, because you're just watching, you know, all the little things run on their automated circuit past your towers that you've already placed with no direct interaction from you, and you're just like, yes, 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 die, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> Most fun part, you're doing nothing but observing. So fascinating, also a lot of fun. And then uh, over the weekend, I streamed a little bit of Diablo 3 uh, to the reluctance of my computer, who was doing everything in its power to keep me from streaming Diablo 3. Uh, and in the end, I think my computer won. Um, as some of you guys know, my computer's been overheating like crazy. Now it's just doing this thing where it just freezes, and then I have to restart it. And uh, it's doing that like multiple times a day now. So um, Sunday was the last time I streamed, and I'm just kind of taking a hiatus until I have some solution to my computer problem. Um, but this has my ability, my inability to play online games has reintroduced me to the world of tabletop games, or more specifically, uh, Pathfinder, which is kind of a version of Dungeons and Dragons. And, and awesome uh, version of Dungeons and Dragons. Yeah, so far it's really awesome. It's kind of complex, so it's taken us a while to learn all the rules, but um, it's a lot of fun. I haven't played Dungeons and Dragons since before D and D was even tabletop. When it was only paper and dice, you didn't have the tabletop. We played second edition like crazy when we were kids, and we were kids, so we like we mm. would we would cheat on everything. Like we would when we made our characters, we'd go into like a separate room. We'd be like, "Hey, uh -uh. me and so and so are gonna go over there and roll our characters, and then we'll just come back, you know, because because there's some people in this room already." We just make up some reason. My my my, my Thacko is two. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> Yeah, we come out. We have like three 18s. Our lowest score is like a 13. <laughs> um, if you guys don't play D and D, those are good rolls. You roll three six sided die. Anyway, um, now we're playing for reals. We're keeping the integrity in there. I'm be. I've been uh, game mastering, and um, oh my god, I'm so addicted already. I'm yeah. I'm such a nerd, but uh, but I'm it, it in is. it. It has been a very long time since I've last had the opportunity to play a tabletop RPG, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons or um, a bunch of my friends really into the White Wolf series of games. So like uh, Changeling and World of Darkness or Mage, I think it was called. I'm not sure. The only one that I got a chance to actually look into was Changeling, and that was a pretty interesting system. Oh. So it's... A lot of fun, that. but it's been years. I, know, I, I need to I need to get back into it because uh, uh, I've been playing Warhammer uh, 40k, and that yes. whole tabletop and social aspect has always been a lot of fun. I got to I got to try Warhammer. You you know what we should do is have a Blizz Pro tabletop game that we stream. We should do that. I'm, I'm actually going to bring that up to Dorian because he promised us a tabletop game months ago, <laughs> and he never delivered. And like the one like teaser that he gave was like post-apocalyptic sesame street it was like what <laughs> wait wait what? Is, is this in a tabletop game that already exists or he's just like making up tabletop games here i believe it actually this is throwing it back to like second edition or ad and d rules yeah. but completely custom you know campaign and it was just ah, oh, it sounded so amazing and then op never delivered yeah, okay well we got to make it happen i think yes. i'd make a, a nice uh, live stream we it would it would but um you know, enough enough about that let's yes. start getting into some of the news because uh, we not much news to cover but we do have a lot to talk about towards the end of the show so let's start getting into it yes we uh, can talk about this all day um yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. And, and as far as Diablo um I'm still using my my Frost Wizard as far as my week in gaming goes uh, I'm really liking the the Frost build even though I've gotten a lot of scrutiny for not using a, a fire build because because uh, that's what the cool kids do. 
Yeah, well, I mean, I'm leveling up a monk, so I am doing it wrong as well. Yeah. Because apparently, you know, uh, according to uh, according to all the posts that I see across the internet, monks are garbage, and, you know, we should just delete them. That's so. true, and, and you are bad for playing one. Exactly. Yeah. Bad job. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I guess we got a, a good amount of news, other than uh, BlizzCon tickets going on sale. Um, oh, yeah, if, I... I was going to say, if you guys haven't gotten your BlizzCon tickets yet... Uh, Saturday, Saturday morning, depending yeah, on where this, you live. Yeah, this Saturday it is. Uh, what is it? It's ten o'clock Pacific, one p.m. Eastern. You know, it's going on. It's the Eventbrite uh, page. You can find it uh, BlizzCon dot com, I believe, or the Battle dot net slash BlizzCon as a, another address in order to get there. It's the first post. It's it gives you a direct link to the tickets page. Um, some people had some issues because they didn't know exactly what to look for because it's completely different from previous years. But in the Eventbrite page, if you go there now, it will say quantity, you know, NA or quantity unavailable. When the tickets go live this Saturday at 10, it's that is going to change into a drop down menu. And you just, you know, click a number and go. Unlike previous years where you could change the quantity of the tickets that you could purchase, this year, that quantity that you pick in the beginning is it. Um, so you have to pick which, how many that you want to buy. You can't just, you know, quickly go and pick a number and then change it later to the actual number that you want. If you accidentally click three, you are buying three tickets or you are gambling and putting yourself back in the waiting list. Yes. I think you can, however, put in different names and change those until June 6th, right? I believe so. They, I believe, yeah, they're giving you two, I think it's two or three weeks that they're giving you in order to change the attendee information. Yeah. And so... Then if you don't know which friends are coming, but you know you have some friends that want to go, you can buy them under your name or some other names and then switch them around as long as you are sure that you're going to have that many friends that are going, of course. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, well, um, I guess also in the news, uh, D3 Anniversary is coming up next week. Yeah, um, they already started a uh, giveaway, which uh, we have a post up on uh, BlizzPro about it. You can enter to win a Reaper of Souls loot pack. You get the Reaper of Souls backpack, the little Tyrael, um what's the thing called? I forget, uh, pop, the vinyl pop figurine. Mm. And is the, that the one like, from the... last year's BlizzPro, or is this, this is a new one? You could buy it BlizzCon, at... Sorry. BlizzCon, but it's not. It wasn't exclusive. You can you can go anywhere and buy them right now. They're ten dollars on the internet. But the biggest thing is is like the new item that they just released is the coffee mug. I don't know mm. if you've seen it or could pull up an image of that. But that coffee mug is amazing. Oh, I wish I yeah. could. I think it would take me too long to get it on there. But yes, definitely check it out. Yeah, it, uh, that that alone. I think it's if you, if you don't win the contest, the thing is only like fourteen dollars. You should go out and buy one because it, it is awesome. Everyone, everyone needs. You don't have to put coffee in it. I hear you can put other <laughs> liquids. So if you're not a coffee drinker, you may be able to put tea, and you might even be able to put water. I don't know. You should try. Uh, <laughs> send us an email. Give us feedback. Westmarchworkshop, you know, at blizzpro.com. Were you able to put water in your coffee mug? We, yeah, we it's good hear. to know. Does Flyer it, just, does it know. just go right through the mug, or do, will it actually? You know, I don't drink anything from a coffee mug, but it's. It's BA looking enough that I might just have to get it anyway. Yep, definitely. That uh, has me uh, has me considering going through and buying one. I I don't know. I just apparently I like coffee mugs, and that one looks awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, and just uh, continue on with the anniversary. Last year they did a week long buff of experience and magic find. I imagine we'll probably get something similar to that for this anniversary. They might not give us the uh, Magic Find buff since they've been very against Magic Find. You know, they they really just want you going out and farming and then using the Torment levels to increase your drop chances. So expect at least some form of uh, experience buff. I don't know if it'll go live all next week or it'll be a week or two weeks from the actual anniversary date itself. I don't know. And I would just keep an eye out for you know what other what other goodies they might actually be going through and giving away or have planned because uh, we haven't heard anything yet. Yeah, that's a good call. I completely forgot to give him that buff last year. But, um, man, a year has really, I guess two years really have gone by so fast. Two years since launch, yeah. It feels like it just came out. Oh, well, it kind of did, somewhat. You know, it kind of, uh, Reaper of Souls is just kind of like uh, reinventing the game almost from the ground up. And it's uh, 
definitely been a nice little experience going back, especially in the last few episodes we're talking about, like, you know, pre-Inferno nerfs and stuff like that. It was just interesting. Maybe we should do yeah. a retrospective on uh, next week's episode in celebration of the anniversary. That's a good idea, yeah. Just like the history of D3. You know, uh, if I can get a little off topic on this. Sure. I feel like I've been noticing, and I think you've noticed too, a little bit of a waning in excitement for the game. And I, I think it's kind of natural. game comes out, everyone's really excited about the new features, um, but it gets stale after a little while, and I mean, I'm thinking 2.1 comes out, a lot of people are going to come back, excitement's going to flourish again, but uh, a lot of players are saying that uh, this is just a repeat of the original launch, that, that everyone's really excited, but it's just going to die out again and not come back. What do you think? Well, I mean, it definitely is there. You, you can see be going through and commenting about that and posting it and people really wouldn't be talking about it if it wasn't happening so there, there's definitely some validity to it it's it's not for everyone just like you know any other game is just going to lose popularity over time you know wow is one of those ones that was just kind of an exception to the <laughs> rule that continued to grow so much year after year until you know finally it you know started shrinking back down you're gonna you're always gonna have like a, a core user base to your games that people that are going to stick through it and play it because they just legitimately have fun. But there's a large portion that are just a, a bit more on the casual side or just a bit more uh, a general gamer. You know, they, they enjoy playing Diablo or Reaper of Souls, but they, they want to play other games. They can't just dedicate themselves solely to one thing. So they just consume through, you know, whatever the hot title is or whichever one that they enjoy. So it's not really surprising. And, when they when they do come out with 2.1 with the the tiered rifts as a form of actual competitive gameplay, which isn't just you know repetitive gameplay, that you're actually gives you incentive to want to do better and to play the same thing over, so that way you can say I'm better than X or better than Y, and then the seasons. The seasons were one of those things that's you know continuing to be a draw to the you know Diablo 2. That those will definitely pull back and make that core user base that plays again and again you know grow a little bit. So that way you'll have you know a bit more stability. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I think where we're at right now is a little reminiscent of right after Vanilla came out, but I think the big difference is we're headed in the right direction this time. Oh, definitely. And, you know, dare I say it, what what might happen when they announce PvP? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm a disbeliever that we'll ever have actual, like, traditional PvP. Um, but I'm also okay with that. I don't, I don't think it really fits with Diablo. There, there is a very, very loud section of the community that will disagree with you that <laughs> yes loves, definitely love pvp in diablo 2 and that's one of the big things that they're well, looking for i to. would argue that brawling gives you essentially 90 percent of what you had in d2 pvp and no one does it yeah to to an extent it, it does it's not quite the same because you used to be able to do in the the d2 system it wasn't just free for all you could actually have teams you know, because you could still be in a party and then, you know, go hostile towards the other players. It was, and you had a larger area with which to play with. It was interesting. But most of the PvP was 1v1, right? Um, not always. There was, there was definitely some that were 1v1. There were some PvP clans that did uh, groups. You know, was, there was a lot of different, you know, variations and flavors that people could go through and do. You know, if Brawling had a community, like a significant community, even if it wasn't nearly as popular as D2s, I would buy that argument. I would say, you know what, that's what we need. We need D2-style PvP. But the truth is, almost no one does brawling. And I, to me, that says it's just outdated. It was fun 15 years ago, 10 years ago, and now we can do better. Well, it's a possibility. I mean, it definitely is. There's it's a, a very valid argument, but uh, I guess in uh, in this day and age, you know, if it doesn't give you the fulfilling PvP experience that you're looking for, you're not going to sit around and wait and try and make do with what you have. You're you're going to find a different game to play. That's true. That's true. Um, yeah, I think there's some people that really are nostalgic for old D2 or just really like traditional PvP. 
Um, in my opinion, they're just never going to be satisfied. I don't, I don't think it's going to happen in D3, but um, but we'll wait and see. Prove me wrong, D3 developers. Nah. Me hopefully they will. Hopefully they will accept that challenge. Yes. Hopefully like, they're all they're... watching this podcast right now, and they'll be like, "Oh, okay. I, I guess we I have to prove so. Archon wrong." So. Uh huh. <laughs> That's that's how they work, I think. No reason other than that. No yeah. reason other than that. Just to prove you wrong. <laughs> this is the first good um, reason they had to put PvP in the game, I guess. Yep. Uh, I guess uh, swinging back uh, over into the news, we have um, uh, one of the new weekly articles that uh, they started two weeks ago or last oh, last, last week. week. They started yeah. it last week. We have uh, the second uh, Goat Man's Guide of the Week, uh, CM Grimiku is now putting together a weekly article on Tuesdays to go through and highlight, you know, one community made build or community made not build. That's, that's Nev saying it's a one community made guide that will try and help you better understand some of the mechanics or help point out some information that they might not have on the game side or just something that's easy to go through and digest, find the information for. And this one talks about cooldown reduction. And they gave a link over to a uh, band of gamers website where they have a, a cooldown reduction calculator because it's not, it's not quite, oh, it's not yeah. quite additive, not quite multiplicative. It has diminishing returns. So it's a little bit of a complicated one to figure out just how much you're getting out of the stat and when it starts dropping off, whether you can allocate some of your Paragon points someplace else, you know, and not, have any effect on your build so it's pretty interesting going into something that's you know one of the more complicated stats in the game yeah that's definitely really useful and i think the majority of casual players probably haven't really figured out cooldown reduction completely i mean it can be really misleading to think that you could stack yeah 100 percent cooldown or whatever you might think when you first get started so i can see that being a really valuable tool for for especially new players but definitely for anyone yeah, we can put that one in the uh, the show notes. But you know, and for uh, people listening to us on iTunes and Stitcher, you know, you can just go through to the uh, Battle.net website, or you can catch it over on Diablo.blizzpro.com in order to find a link over to uh, Grimiku's Guide of the Week. Yeah, very nice. Yeah, I, I think that's a really cool idea. Uh, each of the CMs kind of starting their own weekly thing. And um, because we delayed the show this week, we also got uh, a Theorycraft Thursday to, to talk about. Nevelistus this exactly. new weekly segment. We got the uh, Barbaricare from Squirrel. Bar- uh. Yeah. Barbicare? Barbicare? Barbacoa? Bar- Bar- barbacoa. Yes, that's what it was. It was the Barbacoa build. It is delicious. Uh-huh. If you haven't tried it, it yet, you should pick some up um yeah but it seems like it's uh based on health globes on, on the legendary belt that uh, causes health globes to explode yep and then you know the entire build is just completely centered around that so you know everything that you do with the, the build just tries to help you get more health globes with uh, the skill and other item selections yeah, and they, if you guys look at the guide, it's on a Battle.net or, um, I, I, I imagine, is it on uh, Blizz Pro yet? Uh, not yet. Uh, I kind of got home and jumped into the podcast, so I haven't had a chance to go through and write it up yet. I can't believe well, you, Nine Ball. It's embarrassing know, for Blizz I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. but uh, yeah, if you look, I'm sure it'll be on Blizz Pro soon, and uh, if you look on Battle.net, uh, they have a screenshot if, where Squirrel... If you're not listening to this live... It's gonna be it's gonna be on Diablo Pro. You can find it there. I promise. Yeah. You. If you're not listening to this live, it's already there. We we had it there yeah. like two seconds after it was posted. Don't even. It worry was about up it. the entire time. I was actually lying. Yes. I'm not. That was just for the live people. Ignore it if you're watching. Anyways, um, yeah, they have a screenshot where uh, the barbarian has spawned like just a ton of health globes and is actually doing some pretty good damage just picking up health globes. Yeah, it's, you know, you might not be able to farm Torment 6, you know, quite as effectively as some of the other bar builds, like the uh, the Fire Earthquake Leap, you know, obscenity that they have going on. But it, it just really goes to highlight some fun builds that you can have with just one item changes the entire aspect of how you look at the game itself, which is one of the things that I just absolutely love of Reaper of Souls. When, when looking at it from a non-efficiency standpoint, that... You, you have so many opportunities out there to just make a, a build around almost anything you want and have fun while doing it. 
Yes, if you if you don't care much about efficiency, I think I mean there definitely are uh-huh. more viable builds as well. Um, there's there aren't hundreds of viable builds, but there are more than there were in vanilla. I think, and and by viable I mean if you care about efficiency. Um, but just reading through the comments on these theory craft Thursdays, it does seem like the biggest piece of criticism is that the two builds that they've shown so far aren't competitive builds. They're not builds you would use if you wanted to, if you're min-maxing, so to speak. No. Um, and that, just reading through the comments myself, that seems to be the biggest piece of criticism. And um, and I understand what they're saying, because a lot of players, and I'm in that group, really don't care about builds that aren't as efficient as the top builds out there. And so it feels like a waste of time, for I think, for that entire demographic. However, I think it does highlight, as you pointed out, an important aspect of Reaper of Souls, which is that there's a lot of really fun builds that are going to require you to lose a little bit of efficiency. Um, but, you know, it could be fun to play around with if you don't mind losing it. What do you think, though? Should they should they make some effort to focus on builds that are competitive? Or is this um, or are the competitive builds just going to get found out anyways? And Theorycraft Thursday is better off just focusing on fun, interesting builds that people might not have heard of. You know, I, I'm perfectly fine with them just doing fun, interesting builds that people might not have heard of, you know, things that look like they might be fun to play or change up gameplay in certain aspects. The, you know, the, the go-to cookie cutters now are pretty much well known. They're already been stamped out. There's not a, there's not a lot of new discussion going on for which build is overpowered or which build new is... discussion, right? I just want to make yeah. sure. Okay. New discussion. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so it's you know they, they've pretty much have already been figured out. There's not a, there's not really anything new coming out in terms of what is the most efficient thing in order to farm tier six. Yeah, you know, there's a couple go to builds for every class, at least you know at least one, you know or multiples that they have, and then that's it. If they were to focus on that, it, it would definitely create some content for a couple months. But then afterwards, you're done because you don't really see much else coming out unless they introduce some new items. Yeah. No, that's a really good point. You just need to tell everyone who's commenting on the on the forums now, or the blog rather, that uh, that they're. Well, wrong. I'm just I'm just gonna do what everyone else does on the internet. I'm just gonna go over there and tell them that they're wrong. That's yeah, what I'm that's, gonna do. That's what the internet's for, telling people exactly. they're wrong. Yeah. Well, good on you for that one. Um. Yeah. What else? Um. There were some new exploits and potential hotfixes on the rise. Um, nothing, nothing new that I've seen as far as, uh, exploits go, you know, I guess the, the one like really big unaddressed one, I guess just is still split farming, but I don't think that there's much that they mm. can do to cap, you know, to put a lid on that one. It's just, it, it is what it is. Yeah. You know, I appreciate that you call that an exploit because I think that most players would say that's not an exploit. That's just game mechanics working how they were intended. But, um... But I'm one to use the word exploit literally, and that if you're exploiting a feature of the game, it's an exploit. And so I think I think under that definition, split farming is in fact an exploit. Yeah, I mean, there, there's definitely going to be we'll we'll get some flack for this one, I'm sure, but uh, it, it definitely is not the intent that the developers had when they were trying to foster, you know, multiplayer content to try and get people to go through and act as a group while playing the game that the best way of doing it is to split into four individual parties in order to go through and farm up all the bounties individually and then just meet up in the meet up at the the end and collect the the caches as fast as you possibly can. Yeah. So, no, I mean, yeah, when you lay it out like that, it's clearly uh in a circumstance where players are exploiting the mechanics of the game the way that they're they're built in. I, I think a lot of people have just come to see exploit as synonymous with glitch or or bug and that you're doing something that is game breaking that's you know that you're sp- spamming these spells as you go into a loading screen so you turn out invisible like and they they don't see things like split farming as exploiting because they're not the kind of things that you would get banned for and and those things kind of go hand in hand usually yeah and i guess um that's that's pretty much it for the official news. Some of the unofficial stuff, we've had some very interesting uh, data mining going on yes. this past week. Uh, I guess let's start with the old one that kind of came out uh, last week, right uh, the same day as the podcast, and we decided to skip over it 
because uh, the, they found they data mined the item drop rates that are built into the game for the various legendaries that exist. You know, the, even though they had said at BlizzCon certain items are going to be rarer than others, we now know exactly how much rarer they are than others because they, I believe it's a Korean or a Chinese site found the drop rates in the game code. Most people just assumed that that was something server side, but it was hidden, you know, deep down in the MPQs or they, they changed it. They don't use MPQs anymore, whatever the hell they are now. Um, all of all the drop rate information. And it was just, we kind of had a full, full show. So we decided to skip over and talk about it this week. And since then, I think it was a day ago or two days ago, someone actually found the, you know, the source. Cause beforehand it was just, you know, th- these are the data drop rates. You know, you'll have to believe us and we're not going to give a source. <laughs> yeah. And now, now someone went and digging a little bit deeper and found the, the actual, you know, who had done it, how they did it, where they found it and such. So at first it was reported as being a leak. They didn't say anything about it being data mined, but then it was actually, you know, no, it's in the game files. Yeah. It's pretty cool. I think two interesting things about that. One, that it took them so long to data mine these. I mean, sites like the Owl fans are usually really good about catching new information that hasn't been released in files. And two, this must be new to Reaper of Souls, right? I mean, if we had had the drop rates in vanilla, it would have been data mined by now, wouldn't it? Uh, potentially. Um, you know, was, I actually got into a conversation with someone on Reddit earlier today about it. Something like this, you know, you'd have no idea what the strings or the code, what the tags inside the code look like. So you, you have nothing to go and look for. We, when you have a new patch comes out and people start data mining all of the skills and new items and such, is because they, they know what that looks like in the code. And a lot of that is automated. They have mm. you know a program that will go through go through all the strings, pull the information for what's you know tagged as items, tagged as skills, and then compare it to the previous build and show you this is what's changed or this is what's added. If you don't know what it is that you're looking for, you have to go in manually and try to piece together what what all this you know miscellaneous bits and pieces mean. So it's a lot harder to go through and find something like that when you have no basis uh, to show what it is or what it's not. Well, that makes sense. Well, either way, however they found it, you now have access to all of the drop rates, which might not help you much in deciding your gear, but at least you know if you have a good chance of getting something. If there's a certain piece that's essential for your build and it has a 1% drop chance, you know it's going to be a while before you get that. You might want to look, think about a, a build that's easier to get the gear for as a uh, go-between. Yeah, that was one when I was... Uh... Want to, I still want to go through and do a pet build on my Demon Hunter. I, as any pet build is going to rely heavily upon the, uh, what do you call them, Tasker and Theos. One of the rarest gloves in the game are Tasker and Theos. They have, I think it's a, a built-in like a 3% drop chance. So only 3% of the legendary gloves that you'll find in the game are Tasker and Theos. And I managed to get a Dex one. So it's like, ah. Oh. Yay! It, it, ro- it only rolled attack speed, so I'm not going to have him trifecta. I'll have to keep trying, but it's it's uh, just that made that find all the more sweeter that uh, you actually found you know like this somewhat rare legendary. Uh, it kind of works with you know something in D2 the way the monster level, item level, drop chance, chest thing worked out in that game. Some items like the uh, that I constantly love to talk about because I never found one ever. The Death's Web, you know, that item did not exist. You know, there was like three areas in the game that had a zero 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 one percent drop rate. You know, it's just ridiculous. Huh? Yeah. Well, um, the list is uh, posted on. Is it on Blues Pro yet? Is that, is that... Uh, no, we is not yet. We originally hadn't posted about it because you know. It was it was being claimed that it was leaked information and there was no actual source to validate that info. Now that it's been validated, we're putting together an article for it. All right. Well, then, yeah. If you're not live, go check BlizzPro. If you are, you can find it on Diablo fans or something. Um, but also, Mikey in chat pointed out that the chart is assuming that the item was a smart drop. So there's a 15% chance that it's not a smart drop and then it doesn't follow the chart's rules. It, can, it drops for a different class. But... Um, 85% of the time, it's going to... It works every time. Yes, it works every time. <laughs> nice reference. Yep. 
which um, I think was one of the most interesting things is you know, on a previous podcast, we were talking about the uh, dagger set. Yeah. And how it's the, the dagger set uh, was the rarest. I, they were like the rarest item drops in the game. And that goes into that because they are, they are in fact not on any classes smart drop system. Oh, so it has to be a non-smart drop, huh? Yeah, exactly. So it's uh, pretty interesting that uh, that's one of the ways that they made it exceedingly rare. Is it just, or sorry, it's not a dagger set, it's a sword set. The little rogue and the slanderer, you know, it, it just, you know, it's that 15% chance in order to get it to drop and then combined with its, you know, reduced chance of dropping to begin with. And I believe it's torment only as well. So good luck finding them. Yeah, it's too bad they didn't make those super rare items a little bit more epic. I mean, they're not bad, but you imagine being that rare, it'd be quite a find. You'd you'd expect it to be a death web. Yes, exactly. But um, anyone yeah. that's played a poison necromancer knows exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I really only played D2 casually. I wish I could chime in. But uh, as as far I as forget. news goes. I think that was about was that, was all the big was those the big uh, news pieces. Um, the other big news piece was actually was something that uh, got released today. There was the uh, the Chinese game site, I believe it's uh, Live One Six Three, is what it's called. They released some data mine information for what supposedly uh, new items coming in two point one, potentially some of the season only items. So there's only it's a long list. But only four of the items actually have any stats to them, and so, those ones. The others, do they have legendary affixes or anything, or they're just just names? No, they're just names. That's all that it is. Just names. They have no actual, um, no affixes or no stats. They're just like white items with uh, the legendary tag on them. You know, validating them as a legendary item. Wow. Well, are any of the uh, four items that were revealed worth talking about? Uh, there was one that definitely uh, piqued my interest as a hardcore character. It was a set of gloves that made it to where when you used a potion, it also healed your party members for 40 to 60% of their health as well. Wow, that's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I know in, in softcore, that's, that's nothing to write home about, especially when you're having to uh, match that up against Tasker and Theos or Gloves of Worship. But in hardcore, that, that definitely is a great utility item that you might just keep in your bag just because if uh, you know, a player disconnects while standing in defile, you can go through, throw on those gloves, hit a potion, and give them a little bit of health to try and make sure they stay alive. Yeah, I wonder, in my experience, players will not sacrifice anything on their own character for the benefit of the party. I mean, it's, it's nice to think that you would do whatever's good for your group, but it, it seems like Generally, people are selfishly oriented. Maybe it's a little bit better on hardcore. Do you, do you think people would be interested in that kind of loot? It, it is not something that I would expect in a, uh, a public game. But when playing with actual friends, you know, that's that's something that I, I wouldn't I wouldn't discount people going and holding on to something in those particular situations because you never want your friend to die. Yeah, that's because they're keeping you alive, right? Exactly. There you go. Yeah. We slay together. Makes sense. And we still, die together. <laughs> still being selfish. Just, uh, just, just, uh, you just got your friend there to, to help you out. Exactly. Well, yeah, I, I didn't even know about that. So I, I'm even learning here on today's podcast. That's. Oh yeah. It, I mean, it literally like uh, just broke today. I think around uh, noon or so. And it was uh, it's a pretty big list. It was almost I think like 20, 20 new items or something along those lines. Where they're actually getting this information from, I'm not sure. They, you know, maybe there is a, a PTR uh, update got pushed in Asia that they didn't mean to or something along those lines. So that, that's one still. I guess a little bit of a, uh, you know, again, you know, not really found the validation for that information, so it might end up not being true. But they're they're a pretty big, you know, uh, reputable uh, Chinese fan site that's done a, a lot of uh, really great things in the past. So, uh, you know, who knows? Yeah, well, it's good to know that they're adding new items. I guess we'll find out how many of them are season specific. Huh? Yeah. Because I mean, there there's some of the talk that they 
had you know prior to reaper the uh, launch event that they had over in australia they showed off some monsters that they were creating for the game that would be coming in a later update so there's definitely some things that they're going to be adding into the game whether it's only going to be the things for people that play the seasons you know i don't know it was one thing that they did in diablo 2 and gave a reason for people to play on the ladder or play in the seasons. But I've seen a lot of people that have complained about that uh, since the season's announcements that they don't want ladder-only items because they want to play their big buffed-up character that they've put you know, 400, 800 hours into that's Paragon level 400. They want to continue to play that one. They don't want to start over from scratch or feel forced to start over from scratch by playing in the ladder. Yeah, that's legit, and I don't know... I don't know what the right answer is there. How heavy do you lean into the ladders? How much... I mean, because really, for the hardcore players, the people putting in a lot of time, ladders is almost like a saving grace. Uh, it's something that's going to keep the game alive long after it's it's become dull and you've already gotten all the gear that you want to get. Um, but as far as Blizzard's concerned, in, in, the, in the past, they've seemed to favor casual players more than than the hardcore players. Or I, yep. I should, maybe I should say serious players, since hardcore has another meaning in D3. That it does. We're a special game. We we need special titles. <laughs> yeah, we need our own terms. But, uh, yeah, I mean, really, I think ladders more than anything favor the serious players that are, are getting a little bored of the regular game. Yeah, definitely. It gives uh, repeatable content. Um, and uh, as uh, Nobby in the chat here is uh, pointing out, uh, Josh Masquera also gave a, a tweet today, you know, building the hype going forward that the team is heavy at work on 2.0.5 and that they're currently testing out the tiered rifts in seasons. And that's uh, coming along quite nicely. I, I, even though he, he goes on to say confirmed for uh, next week, though, I... I haven't heard anything about that actually being confirmed or not. Oh, 2.0.5? Yeah, whether that's going to be next week or not. I, I haven't seen anything to actually oh. confirm that information. Well, yeah, if anyone in chat has a link, go ahead and post it, and we'll uh, bring it up later on if if that evidence actually exists. Let's get to yeah. I would love 2.0.5 to come next week because uh, I guess our, we keep saying that one other piece of information that I just remembered. It wasn't something that I put in the show notes, but uh, uh, yesterday, last night, they confirmed that they are looking into the issues that have been affecting a lot of people that have been having lag when you open up your inventory screen or when a new player logs on or when you have the achievement toast that goes and locks up your game for a second or two. They're looking into it and they have a, a fix that they're preparing, but it requires a patch. They don't know if they'll get it into the 2.0.5 patch or whether it will be, have to be uh, patched separately later on once they actually you know implement uh, the fix in the code for that one. But uh, hopefully we'll have that soon. Yes. Yeah, I know a lot of players have been complaining about that, especially hardcore players, I'm sure. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, so hopefully they can squeeze that in. We had a lot of uh, community activity this week. Oh, that people, we have. A lot of people writing in uh, to our email. By the way, if you want to write in for a future episode, give us a build idea, some feedback, an item of the week. Best place to do that is our email, westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com. Say it five times fast. Westmarchworkshop.blizzpro.com. Now, I can't even do it one time fast. <laughs> I already failed. Um, but anyways, westmarchworkshop.blizzpro.com. Send us your feedback. We love to hear it, and, and we're going to show you how much we love it right now with some of our community spotlights. Right, should we go ahead and start with this forum post from SCX? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, SCX, when you say it like that, sounds like I'm spelling sex, doesn't it? But I'm, I'm Ever, not. It's, well, you could try pronouncing it, Skex. Skex. I think that that sounds even closer. I believe. Um, yeah, we're now we're going in the wrong direction here. But but he had a really uh, good idea. I don't even care about lore, and I thought this lore idea was uh, pretty good. What did you think? Maybe I'll let Nineball take the lead on it. But he he'd made a forum post, and um, like most forum posts, he just felt like it didn't get enough attention. Yeah, and you know one one of his most recent suggestions because he's been keeping this uh, post alive for a few weeks now, throwing up his suggestions that he has from the game. His most recent one, one of the ones I found as you know that's not only interesting but is actually implementable by the developers, is uh, just having an indicator per act of which 
lore books you've gotten you know just like almost any other game that you're going to come across nowadays you know when you have collectibles it'll say you know you have 13 of 16 collectibles from this act it would be nice to just put some sort of little counter or indicator in there that's saying that you've collected 15 of the 23 possible lore books from this act you know just to keep track since the achievement itself goes across all of your characters you don't know what you're missing on a new character if you've already gotten the achievement and you know it's when you're first starting off it's a sizable amount of experience at the low paragon levels once you're you know above the paragon level 50 it's not really all that much to write home about anymore but if you if you have ocd about having to have every little thing it's something that you do go out of your way with and trying to rack your brain remembering well which one am i missing you know at what point in the story do i have to go back to in this waypoint in order to try and collect this book that's only available then you know it's just it's you know some way of keeping track so you can you know quell that part of your mind yeah i mean i really don't care about lore books but this seemed like a good idea it seems like it'd be easy to implement and uh those those who do care about collecting lore, lore books would really appreciate it i'm sure so um Definitely. yeah I'll, I'll put a link to that forum post in the description of the the youtube video but um x is that also his name on the forums is that yes so yeah you can go find it yourself if you're if you're not watching the video yeah, go go find it yourself. Yeah, just figure it out. It's just, yeah, you can you can do it. You know the internet, this works. Um, we got a question as well from Bakakido. That's that's my best guess. What about you? Uh, Bakakido. Yeah, one of those two. Take your pick. He wants to know what kind of listen music we listen to. Um, I if I'm playing Diablo, I'm usually streaming. Although recently I've been having the issues, but I would listen to Muse Pandora. Muse, I think, best Pandora station out there. Good stuff on there. Yeah, uh, for me personally, I most of the time when I'm uh, playing, I like listening to Juno Reactor. They're kind of, uh, I guess the official description is Goya Trance. Hmm. But it's kind of like, it's got a lot of tribal beats to it and such. Though they, It's really hard to classify what they do because they, they're all over the table. Um, in terms of what the the types of music that they do. But I'm pretty sure that almost anyone that's listening to this podcast is familiar with some of the work that they've done because they did the majority of the soundtrack for the second and third Matrix movie alongside Don Davis. So you've probably have heard, if you've ever you know, listened to the Burly Brawl or the uh, Highway Chase scene, the Mona Lisa Overdrive, that's, that's all Juno Reactor. Wow. So are you listening exclusively, exclusively to them or do you have like a Pandora station or... Uh, no, it's you know, I'm I'm one of those people that actually sometimes buys CDs. What? So yeah, I know I have Pain I have all of their music. Yeah, I, I have everything. I have every single one of their albums, and so I just have that a, a big you know randomized uh, playlist on my computer. Um, uh, when I'm not doing that, you know, sometimes I'll just listen to the in-game soundtrack, especially if I'm you know just playing through story mode on a new character to try and get the legendary off of. Um, Mouth Ale, because as you play through the story, I think they did a really good job on the music and how it helps build up the uh, feeling as you progress to the fight with death. Um, or I'll actually listen to the uh, Diablo 2 soundtrack, because that, that's some really amazing music there. Mm. Do, you, do you have a preference, D3 or D2 soundtrack? I... I have to I have to go through and say that I still think that the, there are many things in the Diablo 2 soundtrack that the D3 one is just missing out on just a little bit. Reaper of Souls definitely made a lot of groundwork, but uh, it's, it's just really hard to beat some of those uh, classic tracks like Wilderness or The Rogue Encampment. Matt Muehlman made some really, really impressive tracks. Nice, nice. Well, um, our build of the week is actually going to be builds of the week and they totally came from you guys so uh should we just jump right into there oh yeah let's do it all right well we have a monk build i'm going to switch over to that show you the image right now and then i think we're going to do a little bit of gameplay as well okay. this monk build came from iru and um, he had some questions as well, but um, Nineball, as he said earlier in the show, has been leveling a softcore monk, so I'll kind of let him take the lead on this. Um, do you want to tell us about this build? I have it on the screen right now. Okay. You want me to uh, share my screen to show off? Cause I yeah, go for it. Okay. All right. 
you, let me know if you want me to switch over to screen player if you want me to keep this build on. All right. Yeah, go ahead. I've got the uh, the build up as well now. All right. There we go. Okay. Um, this is a build that uh, Ivory went through and submitted. It is, you know, this is, this is definitely one of those ones. It's just a, a fun build to go through and, you know, kick some teeth in. You know, it's going to be great for normal uh, Torment 6. Probably you want to find something a little bit more efficient. Uh, though, you know, if you ask the internet, uh, efficiency with Torment 6 means playing something other than a monk. Um <laughs> But this, the entire point of this build is just to put in as many buffs as possible into seven-sided strike. So a lot of the builds that you can see, the Foresight, Mantra of Conviction, Overawe, Faith in the Light, Flesh is Weak, and the Inner Sanctuary, uh, Forbidden Palace, all give damage buffs. And it all they basically stack up all of these just to go into a single seven-sided strike. They even go with uh, Momentum, so that way they move the 30 yards to get the 15% damage bonus, and then the Mystic Rhythm to uh, you know just hit with Foresight a couple times, so that way they can go through and shell it out. A whole bunch of um, Spirit Regen through items, which I'll get to in a second, and it's just stack all these buffs together, hit 7 strike and strike, and watch all the bad people fall down. Um, yeah, it, it definitely. Going through and reading this one is you know one of those ones that's kind of like, you know, I really like seven-sided strike. That was like one of those skills they showed for the original monk that made me want to play the class. Just it's like I don't care. I'm playing that one. Uh, <laughs> one of the, one of, of course one of the biggest items that they have going for them is the flow of eternity, which you know it basically has the cooldown of seven-sided strike, and they're already using the rune that cuts the cooldown of it down to 17 seconds, and then beacon of Yatar for an additional 20% cooldown reduction and then stacking more items for cooldown reduction to get this down very low. I don't have any of these items, so I can't test it myself. I would definitely like to hear, Iru, if you're still listening, uh, what is the actual cooldown on your seven-sided strike? I really want to know uh, what it is for you with this, because you know, I'm, I'm imagining like a, a, you know, a seven- or six-second seven-sided strike, which being able to put out one of those, the 5,000% weapon damage every five seconds, that just sounds fun. Yeah, that sounds uh, awesome. What, what's the base cooldown of seven sided strike? Uh, twenty five seconds, uh, the, wow. or thirty seconds. The base cooldown is thirty seconds, and then with the rune, they cut it down to seventeen, and then start going from there. Yeah, it sounds like a really nice build. It sounds reminiscent of uh, the Archon build as far as gear goes. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it'd be really interesting to. I'd be really interested to hear out hear them about that. If there's anyone in chat who's tried to build similar to this, let us know what you've gotten your cooldown down to. Yeah, and you know some of the other things that going through and using the two piece uh, set bonus from some Woko's balance. Which is just while a combat staff is equipped, all of your damage is increased by 20%, which again is just there to try and add another modifier, another layer of modifiers onto seven sided strike. Because since he's using the two handed, might as well, you know, buff it as much as they possibly can. And yeah. since you have such a low cooldown on the skill and he's not using Epiphany, some of the other things that he uses are the uh, the Laws of Seth, the uh, Spirit Stone, that when he uses the Blinding Flash, which because of his skill selection and items that he's gearing for, he's going to have a very small cooldown on Blinding Flash as well. And he's always going to use it right before in order to get that big damage bonus. And it's going to give him enough Spirit to cast one or two seven-sided strikes you know, in quick succession with the uh, reduced cooldowns. Other than that, uh, he also is just you know going and using the band of uh, Rue Chambers, which increases your spirit generation even more. I know it says spirit generators, so his uh, foresight, the deadly reach foresight, is definitely going to get buffed by that. I would like to know if that actually works with the band of Rue Chambers, how the interaction with items that make other skills into generators. Does it take that into account? Does it give you 150 spirit when you use it? You know, it'd be interesting seeing because if that was the case, you almost almost be worthwhile just dropping deadly reach altogether. Um, even though it is a 15% you know damage bonus, if you can get the seven sided strike down pretty low, it's some massive spirit generation that you have going on there. Um, yeah, that'd be really. And, the, sorry, yep, and then of course, oh sorry, yep, it's uh the and the primary strategy is you know you just run 30 yards hit everything with Exploding Palm. You get your stack of uh, Deadly Reach along with the uh, 
Mystic Rhythm that gives you the, you know, once you use three spirit generating attacks, which is what you required for getting the foresight buff itself, that it goes through and it, it just gives you the, oh, Birdie wants to join the podcast. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it just uh, gives you this huge buff that you then just go and unload uh, everything that you can. And his question after going through all this and everything that he's doing, he, he just wanted to know how the damage modifier is actually applied since he's getting a 15% damage bonus there, 30% here, 20, 29, you know, it's a whole bunch of different damage bonuses. How much is he actually getting? And, you know, is it additive? Does it just add together with all those totals across all of his skills is 173% or is it more? And the answer is most of those uh, bonuses, or I believe all of those bonuses are actually multiplicative. You know, so anything that buffs, you know, like your physical damage is going to, you know, be a multiplicative buff on your skill damage. So if you if something did 100% damage that's physical, and you had an item that gave you 19% increased physical damage, you're going to do 119% damage. If you instead had a base skill that did 200% weapon damage and then added that same 19% bonus on there, you're now dealing 238% damage because it's, it multiplies the base skill damage, not just adding that 19% on. And then the other buffs that you have from there, like the damage buff from Faith in the Light, that is then multiplied across everything else that you have. Same thing for Mystic Rhythm. So you can get some really, really insane numbers on top of this you know, already 5,000% weapon damage skill. Yeah. So it's... it's a lot of fun is just something you kind of, it does take some farming since it requires, you know, of course, you know, uh, a class set. So that's some torment only farming that you have to do. It, this one isn't really necessary because all it does is just uh, give you a 20% damage bonus, but it seems like a lot of fun and it's something that I definitely am going to, uh, you know, try out once I get my monk to 70 and can, you know, kind of put together some of these items. Yeah, it sounds like fun. It almost makes me want to make a monk. I was going to add that um, the damage bonuses within each category are going to be additive. Um, so if you already have bonuses 7-sided strike, maybe you have 20%, and then you get another 10%, it's actually only going to do you know 8 or 9% increased damage because it's just adding on to that base 20%. So it won't multiply I guess, stats in the same category, but damage to seven sided strike will multiply damage to elemental types. Um, so multiplicative across categories and additive within each category. There you go. Thank you for that clarification. Yeah, it's still probably a little confusing, but um, but hopefully that clears it up for those people who are, are willing to sit and do the math. Um, and we actually had another submission this week. Uh, two awesome builds in one week, both coming from you guys. And the other one was from Titan Mike. We submitted a Witch Doctor pet build, and um, I don't. I have a image of that. Let me sh show that. I don't know if uh, Nine Balls prepared anything for this. Uh, nope. It, uh, I will give the uh, the screen back to you on that one. All right. Well, here it is. Uh, we got summon zombie dogs. Of course, it's a pet based build. It's me on there. Uh, but we do not have our gargantuan. On addition to that, there's a plague of toads, piranhas, locust swarm, spirit walk, fetish army, and the passives are going to be pierce the veil, creeping death, gruesome feast, and grave injustice. Um, is there more we need to know about this build before we talk about it? Uh, no. Uh, this one actually, you know, from their experience, is uh, a mid-level torment. So you can at least go and you know handle torment one, torment two for uh, farming quite efficiently with this one. Yeah, so it seems they have a lot of uh, damage on top of the pets. Do you do you know why they wouldn't include Gargantuan in here? I do not play a Witch Doctor that much, so I'm not quite sure um, why they wouldn't take a Gargantuan other than for this particular one. I, I think that it's... Uh, a lot of the damage itself comes from the fetish army more so than the rest of their other pets. That makes sense. Hmm. Yeah, it seems like you'd want to stack cooldown reduction for this. I, I still can't help but think that once you had a lot of cooldown reduction that just throwing Gargantuan would be on there. I guess it might depend on how much bonus you have to pet damage on your gear. Yeah, and it you... definitely is. 
I was going to say, once you have Tasker and Theos and uh, the helm that increases your pet damage, I can't remember what it's called right now. It is the uh, Mask of Jerem. Oh, there you go. Yes, uh, once you have those, I, I imagine it would be worth it to put uh, Gargantuan on the build as well. I haven't played much Witch Doctor and Reaper of Souls, but, uh, but you know, you're going to be given a lot of bonuses to your Gargantuan once you have the gear for it. Yeah, and you know from the his own gameplay that he goes through and looks at, it, uh, most of his damage he relies upon besides the pets is uh, plague of toads. He likes uh, constantly using the one plagued uh, toad skill that can chain to different enemies. I believe it's they actually hunt them down and they'll explode, and then they'll seek out another enemy to explode on. So you get you know double double the fun out of your uh, your. Uh, poison toads but they also have locust swarm you know it which is just you know it's a great dot you know for so it's nice constant damage it might be something that they could instead replace with gargantuan if they really want to focus more on the pet damage instead of just the all around you know general skills yeah overall this looks like a nice hybrid build maybe as you're starting your pet witch doctor before you've gotten a lot of the essential gear you can still do a lot of damage without relying on your pets, and uh, you got the pets in there as well. Yeah, because that is one of the, the higher level torment builds. Is just the, um, I believe it's the uh, the star that like the next evolution from this point forward would be the star metal kukri. I believe it's called, which makes it so that way every time one of your fetishes attacks, it reduces the your cooldowns by one second. Or it's every time one of your pets attack, it reduces the cooldown. And it's, uh, you you have one or two permanent sets of Fetish Army, and you almost always have Big Bad Voodoo running the the entire time. One of the videos that I saw of it, this they had two two Big Bad or three Big Bad Voodoo's up at once while killing Asmodan. Wow. And they, of course, they had the Gargantuan. And I believe it was the Gargantuan with that turns it into a cooldown to summon instead of the one that's always up. And like so they the got super beefy use. and just. Yeah, and that one, you know, was going through and farming Torment Six with relative ease. It was just disgusting. It reminded me of uh, my Lagromancer days with just how how much it buffed the pet damage. And they really didn't do much other than hanging out in the background and spirit walking whenever an enemy got close to them. Yeah, it, it seems like that uh, Gargantuan the cooldown is really popular for Witch Doctors. Um, it seems like there's two reasons. One, it seems like cooldown reduction is already pretty good for witch doctors. And so if you if you have the cooldown reduction, you might as well take advantage of it. But also, it seems like bonus to fire is still just the most popular for pretty much any class. And and the cooldown reduction in Gargantuan is also a, a fire rune, if I remember correctly. Yeah, it's just that uh, that's Cinder Coat. Yeah. These things, even Birdie gets excited when I mention <laughs> yeah, Cinder, Cinder Coat, so you gotta yeah. know it. Yeah, thirty yep. percent reduction can be uh -huh. a real game changer there. You can't get that for any other element. Yeah, it makes it makes anything spammable, but uh, <laughs> yeah. so definitely definitely some uh, fun builds. The Witch Doctor, you know, the Witch Doctor was probably one of my least played class, but it always has some of the most you know fun and interesting builds out there. It's just it's just crazy. The class itself is just crazy. I'm just going to throw fish and toads and like summon little <laughs> midget skeletons to go and attack you and sit back here and laugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I've had a lot of fun with the Witch Doctor. It hasn't taken me away from the, the wizard yet, but uh, yeah, I think it's a lot of people get uh, some satisfaction from their D2 nostalgia, I think. Mm hmm, definitely. And, um,. Let's see. As far as community goes, I think I think that was it for our build section of the week. But yeah, that goes that goes into our builds. We do have a we do have one more piece of community feedback that we have before we get into the uh, the item of the week submissions that we have, and this one actually comes from someone that we mentioned last week. Uh, we talked about Bloodwater's Crusader, how he submitted a a critique for his crusader. He wanted to see what it was that he was uh, doing wrong or that he could get uh, some advice because he was having a lot of survivability problems in Torment 2 and then died before we had a chance to talk about it. And so, you know, we had a little, uh, little vigil. We did some mourning for him in his crusader <laughs> and then made some comments about what he could do better with his current crusader. And he just, you know, had this really nice heartfelt response, you know, thanking us for, going and helping him out and giving some feedback and how he really appreciated it. And I just really want to say that, uh, 
you know, you don't have to thank us. We thank you for going through and giving us your feedback and, you know, giving us your submission and your story. It's, you know, it's really nice and it can be touching, you know, especially watching someone's crusader die, you know, even though I wasn't there to witness it, it you know, it, it was, it was a sad moment seeing someone that had went and taken the time to go and ask a question and, you know, maybe I, Maybe you know we could have given some suggestions that their crusader had lived had we only done the podcast sooner. But um, you know, it's it's really just a nice, a nice heartfelt response. And you know, definitely uh, thank you, you know, for giving the, us the submission and you know taking the time out of your day to go and write us. We we really appreciate it, and we encourage you know everyone else if there's a question that you have to go and you know submit it in. Let us know what you're thinking about something that you'd like to see done or a build that you want to show off or, you know, an item that you want to show off, which, uh, segueing from there, let's, uh, let's start talking about some of the submissions that we have. We've got a little bit of an arms race going on with our item submissions. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. We've got a lot of community feedback, uh, which we really appreciate. Um, so keep it up West March workshop at blizzpro.com. Let's go ahead and start with um, this first Natalia Slayer. We, I think we've started a little Nat Slayer competition on the podcast. Yeah, everyone is saying that their Nat Slayer is uh, better than the others. So you know, it definitely is. Who who is going to eventually come out on top in this one? <laughs> right. But, but yeah, they, we constantly have ones. You know, they they just beat them out by just a little bit more damage. They're just incrementing up there. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, this one's from Meatloaf80, and um, he wrote us in and just said, mine's better. Yeah, and I believe he he did, it's a higher dex roll and like 30 more damage, I believe. Yeah, so there you go, that's the uh, standing Nat Slayer for the time being. Let's see, we got uh, a Tyrael's Might as well from a Zack. I'll refrain from giving the last name. But uh, got some really crazy rolls. Um, max Alrez, one away from Max Vit, eight away from Max Strength, and then, of course, the three sockets. Uh, that doesn't get much better than that. Uh, definitely not. That's uh, That's another popular one that people like to go and swap out for because of the, you know, the damage bonus on it. Uh, people people like using that one if you're saying uh, farming act four bounties because every every single enemy out there is a demon so this one gives you a 15 percent damage buff while you're fighting the demons if you can't make use of a set piece or a cinder coat yeah what do you think about that i, f I feel like the percentage to certain monster types um makes me feel like the item's useless unless i want to gear swap it 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 really does have that feeling and i don't think that there's much of an argument that can be made in any direction, you know, it definitely is a niche item. You, ha you have to, if it's not, if you're first starting off and you have a Tyrael's Might drop and it's your first legendary chest, yeah, you're going to be using that bad boy because it's just going to be better than the rares that you come across. But it's going to be quickly replaced by almost anything else that you find that might have a more beneficial bonus to it that you can make use of when you're not fighting demons. Yeah. I guess I guess some people don't mind gear swapping as much as I do. Yeah, and again, uh, if you're going to be, you know, say you're still searching for your gloves of worship or your ring of royal grandeur, you're running Act One and Act Two along with Act Four, and so it might might be beneficial to go and have that, you know, just as a backup when you're clearing through Act Four, since literally everything there is a demon. Yeah, makes sense. Well, the next item we got came to us from, uh, let me make sure I get the name right, Rafi? Rof, Not quite sure how you pronounce that, but I'll do my best. And he had some uh, Reaper's Wraps that uh, originally that rolled, rolled as Lightning originally. And then mm -hmm. yeah, perfect Lightning roll, but he wanted them fire. And um, as you can see, other than that roll, they're perfect. And he finally got them to roll uh, 20 fire damage. Yep, so he, he rolled a perfect crit chance, and I mean, that's, what, one point less strength and two points less vit? Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And almost yeah. max on the health gloves, right? Is that, is that max uh, Yeah, I think, I believe the max is 30. 
Yeah, so that's that's pretty impressive. It's not very often that you can re-roll the elemental damage on an item and and not sacrifice something. Yeah, or you know, it's you're you'll find one and just be like, I I need to try and get you know crit or something along those lines. Yeah, you, it's rare you have everything you need and you can actually afford to re-roll the elemental damage. So good on you there. Yeah, congratulations on never needing another set of bracers for this. <laughs> yeah, very nice. Um, let's see, the next item comes to us from Ken, and he actually sent us a lot of items. He sent us 19, I guess his pretty much his set of gear and his offset of gear from D2. Yeah, I believe these are actually some of the best items that he's ever collected because he's kept screenshots of everything that he's come across for years. So he sent us in, you know, a screenshot of 19 of his personal favorite items from Diablo 2. Oh, um, so we, we and, didn't want to take the time to send you, show you all 19 of them, but we have selected one uh, that Nineball has said he thinks is one of the most impressive. Yeah, it's the first. It was the first item that he went through and sent to us. It's a. Uh, it's called the Ghoul Wing Amulet. You know, it's it has plus two to the sorceress skill levels, twenty percent faster cast rate, uh, regener. It has all resist plus mana and plus mana regeneration. That item, you know, back in the day or even now in Diablo two, that is insane. And in order to craft a item with plus two to a class's skills, I believe it was you had to have a character that was at least 93 or 94. So that was, of course, a lot of time invested just to get that character up to that level. And then an insane amount of luck going through and just constantly recrafting items in order to get something like that. So that is, that is definitely a very impressive item. That would have sold for a lot uh, back in the day, uh, for but not only just trading, but like D two JSP, that that thing is impressive. I you know I most have to take your word on it. I mean, it looks pretty nice to me, but I uh, I'm not a D two expert like you. Is the two to sorcerer skills the best part about that amulet? It it is one of the best, uh, definitely one of the best ones on there. Though a lot of those things, you know, because plus eighteen resist on an item was really big back in Diablo 2 because all of your stats capped out at 175 and you got plus 30 from playing through each one of the difficulty levels. So you only needed to get 145 resistances for each one of the individual resists. So having, you know, 18 or 20 made a huge difference. You know, you were, you're, you know, 10% there already of what you needed to get on the rest of all of your other items. That's pretty sexy. Well, we also got uh, from John, we got an almost perfect Stone of Jordan. It is so sexy. And you can see in this picture, he's comparing it to his old Stone of Jordan, which is also pretty nice. Uh, but this one rolled max fire damage skills, 15 away from max int, got the max crit from an enchant, um, and then mm -hmm. the max damage against elites, which is 30%. Um, also got 9 max arcing power, which isn't too bad, but doesn't get much better than that. Yeah, that one is uh, definitely impressive, especially you know with uh, uh, what was it you were mentioning earlier? Because I don't really follow wizards that much. So you're saying that a lot of people are were commenting that uh, fire wizards are the place to be now. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of people getting onto the fire wizard bandwagon. I think if you have wand of woe, it's really worth it. Otherwise, you know, you might be able to do the most damage with fire, but you're getting no crowd control, which you're getting from arcane, lightning, or cold. So uh, yeah, I've been an outcast in that I'm not a big fan of fire, but I, I think it's the I think for almost every class right now, fire is just the place to be. Yeah, well, um, we got let's see one more item, which is another contester for the best Nat Slayer, but uh, looks like it falls a little short of the first one we showed today. Not quite the uh, not quite pushing 2,800 damage. Maybe we could show these uh, back to back, and we could we could see them. Let's see. Uh... Yeah. So, yeah, that one's a little bit higher on the dexterity, but the the additional fifty damage uh, is definitely going to win it out. That's that you know ten percent versus nine percent base damage that the uh, the slayers rolled there. Yeah, not quite getting the damage. Two less discipline. 
Well, it looks like as far as Nat Slayers go, Meatloaf is in the lead. Yep, so Meatloaf is currently winning the arms race. Who can send in the best one-handed crossbow <laughs> in a... Um, yeah, yeah, like, we we like, definitely look forward to... I was going to say, do, do uh, crossbows must just have, have higher damage rolls than most one-handed weapons, huh? Yeah, their, their damage rolls are pretty insane. I actually, you know, I, I play a Demon Hunter, and I didn't know that they could get that high, so that's definitely crazy. Looks like, yeah, it's as far as one-handed weapons go, crazy. I guess crossbows are the the way to go. I mean, as far as trying to get yeah. the highest damage roll there. Oh, not only that, it's for most Demon Hunters nowadays, dual-wielding crossbows for the uh, sockets in order to get the uh, crit damage up there is the preferred method with uh, the cluster arrow build, because you're really going for as much damage as you can in that first shot. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, yeah, I guess it's about time. Dual-wielding was pretty much useless in vanilla. Yep, it was all manticores and quivers beforehand. Couldn't pass up on those two sockets. Nope. Well, I believe that's about all the community feedback we got. Are we missing anything? Um, I think that does about wrap it up with uh, what we had to talk about on uh, the community feedback on the show here tonight. All right. Well, as you guys can tell and the watch regularly know, our show is highly reliant on community feedback. So anything you guys want to send us, whether it's a comment on the show, an item of the week, or a build that you think is worth talking about, send us an email, westmarchworkshop at blizzpro.com. And I think that's going to finish us up. Is there any more topics you want to sneak in before we start the outro? Uh, no, I think that's about it. Definitely looking forward to what we have. You know, I would I would love that our next uh, our next podcast next week starts off with uh, patch notes for 2.0.5, but we'll 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 have to see about that one. But we'll definitely uh, have to think about doing the uh, retrospective of uh, Diablo three in the past two years. You know, because we'll more or less be having an anniversary episode next week, so that'll be interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we'll definitely have to do that. Next week, tune in for episode 7, our anniversary week. We'll be going back through the history of D3, and maybe even dabble in the history of, of Diablo in general. Oh, there's an idea. Yeah. So, uh, should be a good week. I hope you guys enjoyed episode 6 of West March Workshop. Send us in your builds, your ideas, your feedback, and they'll be featured on the podcast. As always... We've enjoyed our time with you guys, and uh, we will miss you until next week. Thank you guys for tuning in to Episode 6, and uh, until next week. Until next week. Stay thirsty, my friends. Stay, stay thirsty for that delicious Diablo juice. That sounded so wrong. Mmm, Diablo juice.